Larry Shields was undeniably one of the most influential clarinetists in jazz history. He was, after all, part of the original Dixieland Jazz Band's pioneering recording sessions from 1917 onwards. It's a shame, then, that analysis of his playing is so often overshadowed by the contested nature of the band's significance. Band leader Nick LaRocca's stridently prejudiced opinions render meaningful discussion of the band and its members all but impossible. I think I'll leave the big socio-historical debates to the trained experts, and those who think they are. Instead, I'd like to zoom in on just one clarinet solo by Larry Shields. On May 25th, 1921, the ODJB, already international stars by this stage, recorded St. Louis Blues for Victor in New York. According to an interview with Shields, available on the Tulane University website, a recording engineer instructed him to take a solo on their test record of the tune, presumably to lengthen the performance, and Shields responded by improvising a solo. It was kept in for the next take, and Shields tried to repeat the solo as closely as he could. It's ironic that this solo, arguably the first on record by any jazz instrumentalist, might have happened for practical reasons rather than artistic ones. Such stories are common in early jazz though, and sometimes they seem far too convenient to be factual, such as Louis Armstrong spontaneously inventing scat singing when he dropped the lyrics for heebie-jeebies. Shield seems a humble man, and we'd have no reason to doubt his story if it wasn't for claims that other New Orleans clarinetists, notably Big Eye Louis Nelson Delisle, originally composed the solo. We'll get to that later. First, let's have a closer look at the solo in question. The St. Louis Blues solo is still copied by clarinetists a hundred years on, with many considering it part of the tune. But at the time of its release, it was even more remarkable. Firstly, in 1921, solos were usually confined to short breaks, with the overall emphasis in jazz being on the ensemble. Shields' solo is not one, but two choruses long, with only minimal backing, notably from Benny Kruger's saxophone. Shields begins with two audacious high Gs. It's not technically difficult to play this high on the clarinet, but doing so is an intense and deliberate creative choice, helping Shields wrestle the foreground away from Al Bernard's vocal. Throughout the solo, Shields repeats a few key phrases with occasional variation, a key tactic for achieving cohesion in blues phrasing. Rhythmically, the solo is highly syncopated, with phrases pulled around so that notes consistently land either ahead of or behind the beat. This gives Shields playing a loosely relaxed yet somehow driving feel. Basically, he swings before swing meant a thing. Shields also frequently employs bent and blue notes, giving the solo a genuine bluesy feel. Shields, like the other members of the OTJB, is sometimes treated as a novelty musician, which is perhaps understandable given that one of his most famous records involves him imitating a rooster. I'd argue there's nothing wrong with novelty, if that's what you're going for. But here, we have clear evidence that Shields was, after all, a fully-fledged New Orleans-style clarinetist. There are notable similarities between the Larry Shields St. Louis Blues solo and the Johnny Dodds solo on Canal Street Blues from 1923 with King Oliver, and it's not simply that they each consist of two blues choruses in F. It's impossible to say whether these similarities are deliberate or whether the solos perhaps share a common ancestor in Big Eye Louis Nelson's playing, but they certainly make for interesting comparison. There's a similar focus on long high notes in the Dodds solo, especially the opening phrase of his second chorus, which begins on a high G, swooping downwards to the dominant seventh, F, just like the first few bars of Shields' solo. Like Shields, Dodds achieves melodic cohesion by repeating key phrases with slight variation. Dodds makes similar use of long, bent blue notes, as well as loose syncopated phrasing that sounds at first as if it's on the beat, but actually isn't when you take a closer listen. A key difference is that Dodds has more prominent vibrato and a wider tone, 
which lends his playing a different weight. Another exceptional clarinet blues solo is Leon Rapolo's on She's Crying For Me Blues with the New Orleans Rhythm Kings in 1925. It shares many of the same traits as the previous two solos. Rapolo begins his solo with that now familiar high G swooping down to the F. We can quickly identify similar bent blue notes and loose syncopated phrasing too. Rapolo makes even greater use of repetition as a structural device. Notice how his phrases in the second chorus tumble down from those repeated high Ds. While Rapolo's phrasing, vibrato and tone sound closer to Shields than Dodds, this is likely due to the strong overall Shields influence on Rapolo's playing, rather than the influence of the St. Louis Blues solo in particular. Regardless of its origin, it seems clear that Larry Shields' St. Louis Blues solo is our first recorded glimpse of a shared approach to blues playing amongst New Orleans clarinetists. <laughs> Larry Shields was undoubtedly influenced by the clarinetists he heard during his formative years in New Orleans. It's also possible he later crossed paths with Big Eye Louis Nelson Delisle, who after all replaced George Baquet with the touring original Creole Orchestra around 1917. Several expert musicians I contacted told me that Big Eye and Shields were the two names that most often came up in discussion about the solo with New Orleans musicians in the 1960s and 70s, but I've also seen unsourced references online to both Emil Barnes and Polo Barnes being the originator of the solo. But let's put aside questions of ownership for a moment. After all, the blues has a rich tradition of borrowing lyrics, phrases, and even entire melodies. Some might call W.C. Handy, who allegedly composed the St. Louis Blues, a curator of existing folk melodies rather than a composer in the true sense. If we put all that aside, we're left with the facts. In May 1921, Larry Shields demonstrated remarkable blues playing that was both hugely influential and recognizably within the New Orleans clarinet tradition. The record was a big seller, and many young clarinet players outside New Orleans, including Benny Goodman, reportedly learned the solo from the record. Once it was on record, just about every clarinet player who wanted to show off their blues credentials could have a go at it each making it their own, adding or discarding phrases as they pleased. Here's just a sample of the clarinetists who either played or recorded their own version of this solo. The two Jimmy Joy records memorably feature him playing it on two clarinets at once, while Sam Lennon's Broadway broadcasters played part of the solo scored for three-piece clarinet section. Harry Shields, on the other hand, always played the solo as close to the recording as possible, in tribute to his older brother. We'll never know for sure which phrases in the St. Louis Blues clarinet solo were composed or improvised by Larry Shields. But thanks to the record, we can at least recognize the mastery he demonstrated in his playing of it.